Hello, everyone. Welcome to Data Byte number 131. My name is Sarita Amrute, Director of Research here at Data and Society. I will be your host for tonight, supported by my team behind the curtain, CJ, Rigo, and Eli. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. You can learn more about us through our website, datasociety.net. Spatially, Data and Society is located in what we now refer to as New York City, a network of rivers and islands in the Atlantic Northeast, home to the ancestral unceded territory of the Lene Lenape people. It is with their permission that I want to open up this space. Land acknowledgements are acts of truth telling that recognize the struggle of the dispossessed, but often fail to name the mechanisms by which indigenous lands were legally ceded. These were deliberate design-based decisions taken under the logic of white settler colonial expansion. And the thing about Northern European settlers is they kept pretty good records, so we have their receipts. I, right now, am in Brooklyn, the ancestral home of the Carnarcy people. And when I think about the current map of Brooklyn, I think about the many pathways that Native people used that now are our main thoroughfares and roads, like Atlantic Avenue and Flatbush. Catherine D'Ignacio is joining us from the lands of the Wamapanoag Nation, and Lauren F. Klein is on the lands of the Muscogee Creek people. Take a moment if you like to post in the Q&A where you are sitting and to provide a land acknowledgement of your own. Well, I turn things over to our speakers to learn more about data feminism. Um, it's great to see people's locations popping up here. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Catherine Dignazio. Um, and by way of introduction, yeah, here we go. Um, we're here tonight, this was to be our very celebratory New York book launch party because both of us are basically major fans of Data and Society's work. Um, and sadly, we can't be here in person, but we're really excited to still be uh, included as a data byte and to participate with all the folks who have joined us tonight to help launch this book into the world for New York people and many other people because I'm seeing that people are from Australia <laughs> and uh, Oakland, California, Ohlone Land, and Manchester, UK, and so on. So those are folks who probably wouldn't have been with us otherwise. Um, so we're really excited to share it with you. Um, so I'm an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT, and I'm the director of something called the Data Plus Feminism Lab there. Uh, and I'll turn it to Lauren. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. As Catherine mentioned, you know, we're, we're sad that we, we couldn't do this event in person, especially I'm from New York, so it would have it would have been great to, to be there and with you all, but um, the virtual event means that more people can attend. So um, we're just really excited to be able to share this work with you. Um, in my professional life, which seems hard to remember, um, I'm an associate professor of English and quantitative theory and methods at Emory University where I also direct the Digital Humanities Lab. Um, and I think that's all for the intro. And so I'll pass it back to Catherine. Great. So um, we see data feminism as a really a growing body of work that's holding corporate and government actors accountable for their racist, sexist, classist data products. Things like um, and I think data and society folks have heard about these in the past already, but things like big space detection systems that cannot see women of color, hiring algorithms that demote applicants that went to all women's schools, search algorithms that circulate negative stereotypes about black girls, child, child abuse detection algorithms that punish poor parents, data visualizations that reinforce the gender binary, all of these things and more. Um, and so we put down at the bottom of this current slide some of the inspirations and the, some of the work that we draw on um, as part of our work. Um, and we sort of situate ourselves in contrast to 
this sort of techno hype message, um, this idea that data is the new oil. Um, some of you folks have certainly heard it's been a kind of a, a meme in the data and technology world uh, since The Economist magazine said it. I mean, it's now been at least like eight years or 10 years or something. Um, it's been repeated sort of over and over again, um, meaning data will yield big extraction, um, extractive profit. Um, but there's been this really, I think, incredible and inspiring pushback just since we've even been writing the book um, that basically is coming from women of color, white women, indigenous people and immigrant communities, LGBTQ folks and more, pushing back and saying, actually, there isn't really anything all that new. Data is the same old oppression that we have been seeing for a long time. Um, and so that leads us to what we bring to this conversation, which is a focus on feminism and a focus on intersectional feminism in particular. Um, but so before we get to the main argument of the book about why data science needs feminism kind of desperately, we thought we'd sort of do some level setting about feminism. So think about like, what is feminism in the first place? Um, so following Beyonce's definition, um, a feminist is about a belief. So a feminist is a person who believes in equal rights for men and for women and for non-binary people. But at the same time, feminism is not only a belief, but it's also organized activity on behalf of women's and non-binary people's rights and interests. So it's belief and it's action. And here, I will turn it to Lauren. Uh, great, yeah, so right, so as Catherine said, feminism, right, is a belief, um, it's action, organized action, and then feminism can also mean a set of theories and ideas. Um, these theories, they begin by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But the past 40 years of scholarship and honestly, like the current political reality have brought many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation. And these include race, class, ability, sexuality, and more. Um, and this sort of leads to the most uh, important takeaway really from this very, very brief intro and overview, which is that feminism in the year 2020 must be understood as intersectional. So um, many of you may be familiar with this term, but if not, um, it was a term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be explained by only one dimension of difference, such as gender. Um, so when we talk about inequality or oppression, we must be talking about the intersection of the many factors and the forces that produce it. So racism, classism, colonialism, and so on. Um, but the, real, the key thing to understand about intersectionality, and it's a thing that's often overlooked, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity and their effect. the structural forces of power and their intersection that produce those effects. And it's the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular that have really done the work of foregrounding this conversation about structural forces. And then just one final note about intersectionality that while um, Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term, the idea was described by many others before her, um, probably most famously by the Combahee River Collective, who in the late 1970s described systems of oppression as, quote, interlocking. Um, and then even before that, in the 19th century, there were Black women scholars and activists like Anna Julia Cooper, Frances Harper, um, Sojourner Truth even, who described intersectionality in practice, if not by name. So, to sort of sum up, um, intersectional feminism, which provides the underlying framework for our book, it's not just about women and gender, it's about power. It's about who has it and who doesn't. And in today's world, as you can see, data is power. And so our gambit is that intersectional feminism, when applied to data science, can help that power be challenged and changed. And so our argument is really this, it's that data science needs feminism and intersectional feminism in, in particular, if we really ever hope to overturn the power imbalances that we see in our data sets, in our data systems, um, and how data affects our lives in the world. Um, so here's the sort of roadmap of the book. 
Um, when Lauren and I were sitting down and starting to draft the book, um, you know, we looked across a wide variety of literature. There's a lot, you know, feminism is a really interesting thing because there's feminist, um, you know, one of the things that Lauren was saying about how feminism is this um, theory or set of ideas. It's one of the most exciting aspects of it to me because it's a kind of intellectual heritage that we inherit and then can operationalize and mobilize to address new circumstances. Um, so we looked across a lot of work that's happened across a lot of different fields. We also asked ourselves what we had learned from our own schooling in feminism, our experiences in different activist communities. Um, and we came up with these seven principles that to us encapsulate the most important aspects of intersectional feminism as they relate to data. Um, and so this is also how the book is structured. So um, we have these principles and then each chapter is about one of these principles. So we have examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies and so on. And we treat those at length in, in a chapter. Um, so the goal here was to sort of not to make new feminism, um, not to like make new feminist theory, but to operationalize existing ideas for data science. So to really think about models that might guide the work of people who are working with data already, people who want to work with data, or people who want to refuse and step away and push back on, on working with data. Um, so the rest of this talk, you know, we don't have time to go into all these things in depth, all the principles. Um, so we're just going to show you three different examples that illustrate one of the principles in the book. Great. Um, so we'll start with this one. Um, this is principle of examining power. And examining power is obviously central to the feminist project because of how gender inequality, as I've already said several times, is at root a question of power. Um, and one of the contributions of feminist organizers and activists and also theorists um, is to give us models that show how power operates in the world. So for example, the famous black feminist sociologist, Patricia Hill Collins, describes power as what she terms the quote, matrix of domination, by which she means that power operates not just from the top down, you know, like the government saying like women can't vote, um, but across many layers of society. And we go into this in more detail in the book. Um, but the key point here is that once we have a model for how power works in the world, we can start to understand how it operates and then how to change it. And in the book, we, in this, the chapter on power, we tell the story of Mimi Onuoha's efforts to collect what she calls missing data sets. Um, these are data sets that a reasonable person might expect to exist uh, because they address issues of really pressing social need. Uh, but because of various reasons, they don't actually exist in real life. Um, so data sets like trans people killed or injured and instances of hate crime, there's no comprehensive database on this. Um, people excluded from public housing because of criminal records. Um, this is a thing that happens to people, but because the people in power don't recognize it as such, we don't have data on this. Or, you know, for a very timely example, like a gender for the number of people with COVID in the United States, right? We just don't have this comprehensive data. So one version of Unwoha's project is a GitHub repository. You can actually see this on the right. Um, it just lists these missing data sets. But another instantiation of this is a physical artwork. Um, it's uh, what you see on the left. It's a file cabinet, each with a, uh, it, it folders inside, and each one has a label with one of the data sets. And the idea is that you tab through the folders and look at the labels, but when you open up the folder, the data set is missing. It's just not there. Um, and as Onwoho explains, and you can see this actually in the GitHub repository, which contains her artist statement, these missing data sets, quote, reveal our hidden social biases and indifferences. And by calling attention to these data sets as missing, she also calls attention to why these data sets are missing. Um, they're missing because of a lack of personal, social, political, or governmental will, or some combination of all of those. Um, or in the case of the coronavirus test, they're missing precisely because of political and governmental will. Um, but in either case, since the data are missing, we can't move forward with our goal of working towards greater justice in the world. So second example that builds off of this, and this comes from chapter two, which is about challenging power, um, is the example of feminicides in Mexico, um, and also in basically every other country, but we, we talk specifically about Mexico. Um, this is another case of missing data sets. 
So in the story of, um, in the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero, who she resolved basically to head straight to the problem and collect the missing data herself. So just to explain a little bit, feminicides are gender related killings of women and girls. They include cis and trans women. They are legally defined as crimes in a handful of countries, including Mexico. So there's actually a legal framework that says that, uh, you know, that characterizes this as a crime. Um, but the state is not systematically collecting data on feminicides. Um, and so they're the subject of emerging public anger in Latin America. You can see the hashtag here, ni una menos, which is, means not one less, not one less woman. Um, so the state sort of is neglecting to fully implement its own laws and provisions and to actually measure the scope and the scale of the problem. So frustrated, Nasagero is a kind of individual citizen. She was frustrated by the lack of action. And so in 2015, she started just single-handedly compiling a database. Um, and then she was doing it for, she's now been doing it for five years. And at this point, she's amassed the um, largest public database of feminicides um, for the entire country. Um, she spends two to four hours a day logging uh, these deaths on a Google map um, that she calls for media reports. Um, and she has helped families locate their loved ones. She's shared her data with journalists and activist organizations. And she's even testified in front of Mexico's Congress multiple times about the issue. And so in the book, we characterize this as an example of feminist counter data, a way to do activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their populations. So it's one way to use data to challenge power. Um, but it comes with an important caveat, um, which is that not all problems are problems of missing data in the first place. Um, and also not all problems can be addressed by collecting counter data. Um, and we characterize this kind of, we say this repeatedly, I guess, in the book, but data is a really double-edged sword. And so more data is not always better, right? Because sometimes more data puts vulnerable people in more, um, in more paths of harm. Um, so other strategies to challenge power also include things like auditing algorithms, teaching data science, like an intersectional feminist would, um, and centering equity and justice instead of, or in addition to, ethics in data science. So um, another thing that feminism can do is not just help us identify issues to address, but also to inform the process of data science work. Um, and so this actually, this example comes from what's well, sort of a combination of principles. Um, it comes from the chapter on embracing pluralism. And the idea derives from Donna Haraway's idea of situated knowledge and her view that the most complete knowledge comes from bringing together multiple perspectives. So in this model, knowledge is not top down, um, but it's created through dialogue and exchange. And ultimately, because you're bringing together all of these different perspectives, it results in a more complete picture of the problem at hand. And we see this in the example of the anti-eviction project. This is the large image on the left, also known as the AEMP. They are a self-described collective of, quote, housing justice activists, researchers, data nerds, artists, and oral historians. And since 2013, the AEMP has worked to quantify and organize around the housing crisis in San Francisco and the greater Bay Area. Um, they work in collaboration with tenants' rights organizations and community groups, and they also create oral histories, which is what you see here in this narratives of resistance and displacement map. So each blue dot on the map leads to a video story from a single person or a family who is facing displacement from their home. So in the book, we contrast this with the eviction lab, which you can see in the smaller image on the right, which is based at Princeton University. Um, this lab's goal is to present a national picture of the eviction crisis. And we should say this is a really worthy goal and it's a valuable project, but it's really widely different in terms of process, right? Um, the eviction lab's map derived from seemingly bigger data um, and the map presents a seemingly more comprehensive picture of the problem of, evic of eviction in the United States, but uh, the AEMP has actually shown that national real estate databases, like the ones that the eviction lab uses, they significantly undercount evictions because there's a sort of a litmus test as to what qual qualifies as an eviction. And as 
many people have firsthand experience with, you know, you can be pushed out of your home in a lot of different ways. Um, and working instead with local tenants' rights organizations, the AEMP has gathered probably messier, but actually much more comprehensive and more contextualized data um, that documents a greater extent of the problem at hand. All right, so this brings us to um, the last point we want to make in the presentation, um, which is just that <clears throat> one of the things we make, and now I, even I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure we even made it strongly enough, <laughs> but I think uh, we think that data feminism requires an expanded definition of data science. Um, so our argument is that data science is not about the size of the data. It's not about the sophistication of the analysis methods. And it's also not about the technical credentials of the people undertaking the work or the places that they're affiliated with. Um, because these dimensions are always continuously, repeatedly, still today, um, used to exclude women and people of color from the field, as well as to exclude work whose contribution, whose innovation is socio-technical rather than just purely technical. Um, and so by expanding the book, and that's what we try to do throughout the book in terms of whose examples, where, from, from where do our examples come, um, we see that some of the most exciting work in data science today is actually being undertaken by artists, by journalists, by humanists, by community organizers and activists. Um, so here, just to tell you whose work we're showing on the slide, um, we want to give a shout out to Margaret Mitchell and her team for her research on bias in natural language processing. Um, artist Stephanie Dinkins, who's pushing the boundaries and the scale of data with her interactive uh, sort of talking sculpture that was uh, trained on an intergenerational dialogue between black women and her own family. Um, on the right, you can see the puddings, inventive and fun and uh, super interesting data journalism, which is exposing gender bias in Hollywood screenplays. Um, and then finally at the bottom is a data mural by the group Data Therapy, where they work with community-based organizations to create data murals um, in situ with uh, people from the community. Um, and one of the reasons we're saying this here too is, um, you know, because in the open review process for our book, we actually got a number of comments of like, oh, these are seem like nice little projects that you're including, but they're not real data science. And so we, we realized like, oh, we really need to be very clear that we consider these works data science. <laughs> so um, so that, that, that I think is one of our arguments and I think a way to enlarge the field and the playing field and the table and who's at the table of what do we actually mean by data science. Um, so, Lauren. So uh, here's just a little bit of review. Um, so data feminism is data science that exposes and challenges power. Um, it's led by and ideally centers minoritized people. Um, it can be a counter data science about the injustices created by mainstream data science. Um, it's unfortunate that we are in this situation, but that is a reality of life today. Um, it looks at many axes of inequality, including but not limited to gender, um, race, class. Um, it considers process, how inequality permeates all stages of a data science project from funding and choice of research to undertake out to deployment and circulation of the product. And then it credits labor. Um, it acknowledges how data science is the work of many hands. So I think that's all we have for our formal remarks today. Um, thank you so much for listening. And now uh, eager to hear your questions. Thank you so much for your talk, Catherine and Lauren. It was really beautiful. I'd love to learn more. Everyone who's tuning in, please post your questions to the Q&A, and I will try to ask as many of them as I can before we run out of time. But as the moderator, I'm going to take a little bit of my moderator's prerogative to ask you a few questions to start out. My first question is about the work of Patricia Hill Collins. You both used Patricia Hill Collins scholarship in your work. I've been seeing her popping up quite a bit lately, and it's really gratifying. Can you tell us a little bit about when you were first introduced to her scholarship and why her matrix of domination plays such an important role in your own? Sure, I'll take the first uh, answer there. Um, for me, it was, uh, I, I was, uh, I ran a big uh, sort of research project slash feminist hackathon 
uh, called Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Hackathon. Uh, this is now a couple of years ago. Uh, so back in 2017, we were planning that. And that for me was actually the first time I had come across her work because we were doing a lot of work. It was a equity, meaning a racial equity and socioeconomic equity focused hackathon in terms of who we were working with and um, who were the innovators at the table. Um, and so through, it was for me through a webinar with the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, which is a maternal and birth justice group here where they were talking about um, sort of uplifting the voices of black leaders in the maternal health crisis in the United States. That's where I first learned about it and, and it was in the framework of birth justice. Um, but then I'm also, uh, uh, have been really fo closely following uh, Sasha Costanzo work, uh, Chalk's work on design justice and they draw, also draw on the matrix of domination um, so that was also really inspiring to see. So it feels like a very current, even, you know, even though the book was written now uh, many years ago, um, I also am enjoying the fact that it is being brought back in a number of different ways and feels really relevant for this present moment of uh, data and AI. And then Lauren, I don't know what your yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just say like I, I'm, I am and have always been like a big theory head. Um, and so I can get down on a lot of theories of power. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really important about uh, Patricia Hill Collins's work and actually, you know, it's interesting, we saw some it's like a, a, a formal philosopher read our book on Twitter and then was like, this is under theorized. It has good examples, but it's under theorized. And it's like, no, actually, this is, this is a, a, quite, like, a quite thorough theory of power. Um, and I think what makes it really useful uh, for our book and also useful as a feminist theory is that it takes the personal into account, right? Like you have a lot of ideas about how power works in the world. Like you can think of like Michel Foucault, um, the Panopticon. You can think of like Louis Althusser and the Little Triangle, right? Um, but very few of those theories name how power operates at the level of the individual and the sort of community and the group. And so again, sort of getting back to what we said at the beginning, you know, oftentimes, as soon as you see it spelled out for you, you're like, oh, right, this is how it works. But until you have someone providing you with a conceptual apparatus that sort of shows you how it works, it's sometimes hard to uh, sort of pinpoint from like the undifferentiated mass of like forces in the world um, how things are working. And so that's what I really value about her fear about the matrix of domination in particular. Thank you, that's extremely helpful. I like the way that you're pulling on a theory of power that both gets at all the intersectional frames through which power operates, but also works at different scales, right? as you're saying, Lauren, that's really helpful. Um, my second question is, is related to the slides you showed, and I'm just gonna hold up my copy of the book. <laughs> Um, the book is absolutely gorgeous, and I'm, I'm opening it up to a uh, an argument that you were making. That as soon as I read it, I went and showed it to several people in my household, and so I wanted to hear a little bit more from you. And I think it relates to the point you were making at the end about artists, uh, journalists, activists being at the cutting edge of data science. I wanted for you to talk us through a little bit your decisions on the aesthetics of the book. It's a very beautiful book. Uh, it focuses quite a bit on data visualization and maybe backgrounds a little bit data collection. And I was wondering if that was an intentional choice and if you could talk us through some of the thinking behind the focus. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so perceptive of you to have noticed that um, because there's sort of the physical book, but then there's also what led us to that point. And, you know, Catherine and my first work together was on the topic of visualization and the book actually, or at least the project started as thinking through the idea of feminist data visualization because both of us in different ways have prior work in that area. But what happened as we started to draft really the proposal for the book, we started to realize that you couldn't talk about the end product without the, <laughs> the process that leads up to it. And that was what sort of took us back. So it was almost sort of a retrospective, like going back to the beginning and say, okay, well, how do we get to the point um, where we end up with these beautiful and uh, compelling and evocative images? Um, but then the other thing that I'll just say about the, the book itself, you know, and Catherine mentioned this earlier in the talk, you know, we really see a lot of what we can do is bring together all of this amazing work that is already out there. Um, 
you know, we don't think we're reinventing the wheel with this book. Like there is just so much work to draw on, like not by us personally, but by so many people. And we wanted to make that work as compelling as it could be to our readers um, when they encounter the book. So, you know, we did and we sort of deliberately marshaled resources towards like paying for color photos and things like that, um, you know, because we wanted to be able to represent uh, the material as best we could. I don't know, Catherine, if you have other things to add. Yeah, I think, I think the, yeah, the only thing to add is um, thinking through how um, there's been so much work that's going on in a variety of different fields, like critical data studies, um, law and policy, uh, the FAT conference and uh, related sort of technical work um, that's sort of interrogating questions of power and structural oppression and data. And yet, there, to me, I think and to us, there was little work that was actually addressing data communication and how questions of structural inequality are also showing up in our objects of communication, whether those are visualizations or scrolly telling things by journalists um, uh, or so on. And so it just, it felt really worthy to introduce that aspect as well, since often that is the broader public's sort of interface to these questions. It, it felt like really worthy to bring our attention also there in addition to like these other stages of the pipeline. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's great. I'm gonna show another page from the book that probably won't be too <laughs> visible to people sitting at home. But my third question relates to something that Catherine and Lauren do at the end, which is they make this very courageous move at the end of the book to do an audit um, of how the book did according to the principles of data feminism the book outlines. So you can see that audit here. It has, um, it has various categories like racism, um, patriarchy, heteronormativity, and then they outline what their aspiration was and how the book did. And um, I was hoping you could talk to us about what you discovered doing the audit. Do you, you find that this kind of audit kind of contradicts or, or problematizes in some way some of your data feminism principles, for instance, the principle of centering embodiment? Thanks for that question. <laughs> um, yeah, so okay, the background on this is um, I think this in a way also relates to this hackathon project I was working on where we're really focusing on equity. And as part of that, I want to do a shout out to Jen Roberts, who uh, was part of our leadership team. And she actually for that particular event helped design these uh, metrics for inclusion for who who we wanted at the table. Um, and mainly that was around uh, people of color and socioeconomic diversity and thinking through like what makes for an inclusive space. Um, and so when we started working on this, we were talking a lot, we, we started having conversations about exactly these citational politics of like, then who do you cite? Because as you cite somebody, that's a really meaningful um, thing. You're sort of bringing that person's voice into the room. And yet, you know, so much of the work, like so much of data science is, is very male, very white, very elite. Um, and so really thinking through how do we give ourselves a challenge on this to bring uh, into play, to consider all these different dimensions of oppression and bring into play other voices. And so we set these metrics and we're very explicit of like, you know, we want 70%, we want to cite 70% people of color, for example. Um, and we did that in the first draft, we posted an open source draft back in fall of 2018 and we did an audit of that draft. And then we re-audited, and we, then we revised the book, and then we re-audited. Um, and the interesting and somewhat disheartening finding, I think, for us was that in the process of taking in all the comments that we received uh, between the open source version and the final version, we reflected, and we write about this at the end, we reflected on how we made the book, quote unquote, more academic, because people were like, who are you citing, you know, support this thing you said here, support this thing you said there, you know, and so we, we did that, um, and we, but we purposely were not trying to gain the metrics either. So we like cited the thing and we did the thing or whatever. Um, and so we weren't really doing like any kind of real time tracking. We re audit, um, and then and we, know we did sort of worse on our metrics. And so um, I think for us, this was a sort of experiment. Um, I think there are ways to look at it like 
and, and we, we got criticized for it too. Like we had some interesting conversations about it with people because they're saying, you know, you're reducing intersectionality to just like one dimension or if you're counting like a trans author, you're imagining that they're like speaking for that, about that oppression, which they may or may not be, right, of course. Um, but I think for us, it was a challenge to ourselves to try to walk the talk and then also realize how when you walk, you like want to walk the talk, um, we're still failing because of these various kinds of structural forces, one of which I would say is the pressure to create an academic book <laughs> that, that cites the people that people are like, oh, you have to cite this person, you know? Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, um, I would say I stand by it as an experiment um, and I would challenge others to, uh, to do it and challenge ourselves to do better next time. I don't know how you feel. Lauren, we haven't really talked about it since we, uh, like wrote that last statement in the book. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think the, you know, it was a super interesting process for me. You know, I, um, you know, I, this, this was, it was really, Catherine was bringing this from the Breast Pump Hackathon and it seemed interesting to me. You know, I work with a lot, of, in my, some of my other historical research, I work with a lot of data about people and I think a lot about what it means to sort of reduce lived experience to, you know, a uh, checkbox, and we used a spreadsheet, and actually we had, we should mention, um, Izzy Carter, our research assistant, actually did all of the work of um, identifying each of the people and scholars and projects and uh, people who we cite in the book, and they write a little bit about their process in the book as well. Um, you know, I so, so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that act of sort of reducing life to a data point, um, and especially sort of the legacies and um, slavery and colonialism and, you know, it's really like the violence that just sort of inheres in that act. Um, but I also, and this is something that, you know, Catherine and I did talk through, and I think we both believe, like, you can sort of hold two things in your hands at the same time, right? You can understand how this is not, this doesn't, this is, you're not representing the people who we're citing and the richness of their work and their lived experience, but it also sort of shows you a way forward. Um, and just to sort of like make this less abstract and more concrete, you know, one of the really interesting things, I think the, in the revision process, I would say also because we did it like furiously, you know, we, I don't know if for those, I don't know who read the draft and then read the final version, but it's like 50% longer, there weren't footnotes, now there are 600 or something or like it just million. <laughs> and, and they're good read the footnotes <laughs> but notes are good um <laughs> but in the first draft it was really interesting because you know we did have these metrics and we actually we also came up with sort of our statement of our values and what we wanted to inhabit as we were writing the book and whose voices we wanted to center and we initially realized that all of our chapters began with sort of like a bad object you know, it'd be like Edward Tufte or, you know, Francis Galton or, you know, like some of these like old white men who sort of have, you know, tend to be cited when talking about data practices. And one of the things that the metrics or the knowledge of the metrics in the back of our mind made us do is in most but not all cases is like remove the bad object. It's like, why do you need to be oppositional from the start? Why do you need to sort of reify those people by having giving them the opening, you know, the opening salvo? Um, we can just start with who we want to say and can we find someone or can we just think? And usually it was like 30 seconds where you're like, oh, I don't need, you know, Francis Galton. I need like, you know, Jessica Marie Johnson, who's a contemporary scholar writing about like the history of data. And you, know, so you can start your conversation elsewhere. And I think making it explicit, you know, whether or not, and again, like we didn't have the data on our choices until after we made the book, but sort of having it lurking in the back of our mind, um, at least for me, I think um, made that sort of more a part of the routine of the process of writing. And it's definitely something that I've thought more about moving forward. Not as much, you know, like I always cite the people I like, but it's made me think more about removing the people I don't like um, in some of my other work. <laughs> I think that's such an astute answer because to me what it's showing is the, the queries that you're making of the book as data actually help you produce a counter conduct a counter narrative, a counter data around the project, which is wonderful. I'm gonna turn now to some of the amazing questions budding up, building up in the Q&A chat, and I'll read some of them out. There's a lovely question that kind of leads right 
from what we were talking about um, just now. The question is, I work in transparency and open data. A collective of women and non-binary folks in this space have founded Open Heroines to raise the issue of gender in our sector. One of the things we often come across is people saying, quote, the problem is not with gender, it's with inequalities, unquote. Have you come across th this in your work? And I think the follow-up is, how do you counter that kind of an argument? Thanks. Yeah, um, well, I'm super interested to learn more about Open Heroines and go look them up. Um, so, or if somebody could post the URL in the chat, that would be great. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, what I hear in that response is that they're downplaying that gender might count as one of those inequalities, <laughs> potentially. Um, so I think like um, that to me is already, a, a, you know, kind of a, a flag. Um, so I think it's sort of like saying there, gender is one of those equalities and there are these other inequalities and we are concerned about all of them, but we are taking a specifically gendered lens on them. Um, and there's increasing, I would say like precedent and value and recognized worth in taking a quote unquote gendered lens. Um, so if you look at things like whatever the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, there's various urban planning uh, researchers right now like Ines uh, Sanchez de Madariaga who are advocating for a gender aware approach to basically like every kind of city service design, every kind of built environment design. Um, so I think there's like a really that you could call on a broad range of arguments for why gender specifically really matters. I don't know what um, kind of domain you all work in, um, but I mean, I think my response back would be like, yes, it's about all of those inequalities and we're working specifically on gender, which is a huge aspect of that, of those inequalities. Um, and uh, yeah, and that would be my, I don't know if Lauren, you have something to add. No, that was terrific. I mean, I guess like the only thing that I will add to that too is that, you know, what usually ends up in those moves is sort of a displacement of responsibility. And one of the points that we make in the book is, you know, whether you're talking about inequality more generally or gender in particular, it shouldn't always be the responsibility of the people in the minoritized gender position to fix the problem, right? Um, it actually is more of the problem in the people in the majoritized position to do the work of making the space or the data set or the, um, you know, whatever it may be, um, institution open to people of all genders. Um, and so, again, you know, it's sort of like this I mean, to me, and I'm sure that the person who asked the question is familiar with this firsthand, but to really beware like the deflection of responsibility and in the response to not just sort of reclaim gender, but also to reclaim sort of collective responsibility, um, you know, regardless of what your personal gender is. Thank you. We have a question about studies and training or a few questions and I'll try to collate them. Thank you for your fantastic talk. I'm an undergraduate data science student. Another one is a recent grad with a mathematical background currently working in data science. Uh, they both are interested in data feminism and issues of social justice. Do you have any advice for budding data scientists trying to find their place in this world, in this research space or as a volunteer? Yeah, um, so thanks so much. Um, yeah, okay, so undergraduate, I think uh, Lauren should talk about her lab. <laughs> oh, uh, right now. Hi. <laughs> well, just because it's like, I, I just think your department is super interesting. Like, they're creating a really interesting connect space between humanities and technology. Yeah, I mean, I will say just sort of in general that to me, like right now is a really good time to be having these interests because, you know, unlike, and I think this is sort of one of the things that brought Catherine and me together, I think across uh, uh, territories and sort of like walks of life was that we both had this experience of being interested in both of these issues and not really finding a path in formal academic training in order to do this. Um, and like my response was to sort of toggle between to what I thought were sort of a binary choice, one was sort of humanities or computer science, and Catherine left academia 
for a long time, just thinking that wasn't the place for her, and then came back later. But I think that that's changing in certain places. Um, and if you sort of pay enough attention, you can see spots, you know, like at Emory, where I am, um, we're trying to create this new department. It is a department as of this year um, that's bringing together uh, sort of formal statistical training with traditional liberal arts uh, disciplines. There's places like Bucknell that have a really interesting ethical CS department or sort of uh, curriculum and they're trying to reshape what it looks like to study computer science, sort of foregrounding issues of ethics and justice, um, which is sort of a long way of saying that I think even though the sort of there aren't these like ossified institutions that will guide you in your path, I think that there are individuals who you can uh, seek out and by all means like person asking the question please email me um, and I think that many academic communities are open to this kind of synthesis in a way that I don't think that they were as much before um, in terms of finding jobs um, you know again it's sort of like there are sort of practical there's like places you can look but then maybe Catherine can sort of speak a little bit more to that as well and then the last thing I'll say before I'll pass it back to Catherine is just that like you can always make choices from the place where you sit, you know, sort of, or stand, um, uh, you know, regardless of the, the context in which you work, right? Um, and so there are always small choices that you can make, even if external constraints have you in a place where, you know, people who control the work that you do are less invested in issues of justice. Um, you know, the choice is not, you know, obviously it would be amazing if everyone could choose and find a job that aligned perfectly with their interests, but, you know, we recognize that's not always the case. Um, but I think it, it's important to recognize that just because you're not in the perfect situation, it doesn't mean that you can't sort of make um, little attempts to, to change things from where you are. Okay, I think that's, I'll pass back to you, Catherine. Yeah, the only, I think the only last thing I'll say is um, <clears throat> looking at ways to get involved um, through both work with nonprofits and also in community-based organizations and movements who are working with data. So like in, one interesting organization to look at is DataKind, who's starting basically kind of like a, a service core for uh, data scientists. Um, so that's a really, it's kind of an interesting model, kind of like the volunteer lawyers where, where data scientists work with nonprofits and community-based organizations in a kind of structured way. Um, so that's one to look at. Um, and then there's other groups who have sprung up. Um, I mean, the one that comes immediately to mind is like Data for Black Lives um, or others like Anti-Eviction Mapping Project for whom data is really central to the, the movement building work that they do. Um, and so I think that is another, of course that's um, probably, you know, can't get maybe a full-time job. Those are still kind of like small efforts, but um, I think those are ways to um, connect with folks, uh, to connect with like-minded folks and to kind of further pursue that pathway. And one of the things that I always say too, I mean, like Lauren, I followed a path where it's like, I have very disparate interests and for, a long time I thought they had to be separate and then but then I kept believing that they could come together and eventually I was able to find a way so I mean if there are things that you are pursuing in conjunction with each other I think you can find a way to bring them together and I would encourage you not to to give that up even when the world tells you that those two things don't belong together <laughs> so. Okay, I'm gonna try to squeeze in at least two more questions from the Q&A um, one building on what we've been, just been talking about is Many development organizations are working with big data corporations like Facebook in order to use their data to paint clearer pictures on issues like femicide and in turn look towards solutions. What do you, I've lost the question here. It's slipped, um, here we go. What do you think about the ethics uh, behind these collaborations with big tech, especially when interrogating how these corporations gather and sell their data? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge thing to consider and to look at, um, and not only because of the corporations participating, but also honestly because of the international development organizations also participating in those kinds of collaborations. Um, you know, so one of the things that we say uh, in data feminism or that one of the things that an intersectional feminist lens can bring is this idea of asking who questions. So like who is doing the work? Who are the data about? Who is being harmed and who is being benefited? And, and really thinking about that from a systematic perspective. And so when we're talking about like elite international development organizations collaborating with uh, elite super rich corporations, um, 
and then gathering data and then using that data to make decisions from afar about people kind of in the global south most likely without their participation i think for me that i i don't necessarily see how that works out i mean i think so i think what we would advocate for from a data feminist perspective um, is really much more about participation and co-creation um, and a much a set of much more participatory methods which i think don't preclude the idea of a big picture um, it's just thinking about how do you acquire the big picture and for who is the big picture <laughs> right um, and so i think that's um yeah that that's my response i guess Lauren, what do you say about that? yeah i mean I, that's a great response the other thing the only thing i think i would just add to that is right is that even though you're getting a bigger picture it's not the whole picture like you will never have that right um and in the book you know we talk about this from a lot of different angles but um, we have a chapter on context and we talk about, for instance, Sophia Noble's work in Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and she talks about Google data, which, you know, is like some of the biggest data that can be. Um, and, and yet, like, it still doesn't give you the complete picture of what's going on. So her example um, is like if you search on black girls versus white girls on Google, you know, if you search for white girls, you get like wholesome stock photography and if you search for black girls you get taken to like pornography you know like there's a vastly and this is coming from people who have these biases that are then clicking on the search results that they want to see which in turn tell google's algorithm that those are the search results that more people want to see and there are a lot of search results i mean there are a lot of like user clicks on google right like i don't know you know if it's billions or quadrillions or what even number it is like it's it's huge and yet you still can't look at that picture without looking at the larger context in which these data are produced in order to understand what it is that you're looking at so um we talk about so you know yeah. I'm going to ask a question that follows on this point you're making about for whom is the bigger picture and how was it acquired. The question is, you've talked a little bit uh, about your dis in your discussion about femicides in Mexico, but could you develop questions of privacy in those missing data sets? Minorities can be more easily identifiable. How are those data sets taking this into account? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we very consciously profiled kind of the position from below. I mean, the position from Maria Salguero's calling of news media reports um, in the in the work. Um, uh, specifically, although I actually, I guess it was also the only one of like I, I actually don't know of any like really comprehensive effort on the part of governments to monitor femicides either. So I guess potentially we could have looked harder for one of those. Um, but no, I think there's um, there's potentially huge issues of privacy. Um, also, especially when you're talking about something like feminicide there's risk of um, media reporting that comes out before the person has actually like the then the family has actually been notified um so i think that's that's actually happened to maria salguero where like the family like, ends up getting in touch with her because they're searching for one of their loved ones and then they like find them in her database um i mean it's called from public media reports but still it's like she's keeping this comprehensive archive um so yeah i mean i think the um the issues there are huge and we can think about those also in relationship to um you know sort of when administration shift. So uh, in the book, we name this as the paradox of exposure of data. So it's sort of like thinking about like, when do you want to be counted? Like, when is it a good thing to be counted yourself or to count a population? And when does it actually expose you to harm? And so we can think about that in relationship, for example, to the DACA program, where like, under the Obama administration, they were like, you know come and register yourself with us all you young undocumented folks and you're going to be okay and we'll like give you a path to citizenship and then um currently now administration shifts and now there's this great registry of uh undocumented folks that the administration can then pursue and so like i think these are very um these are really hard questions especially if you are the person who's collecting and holding that data because even though i'm sure 
under one administration, they maybe had good intentions of doing that, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, we get into the situation now where that is a huge risk to, to these young people who have lived in the United States their whole lives. So, I mean, I think the, the only thing I point back to is that there is no one, um, like there's no one size fits all. Like we actually have a chapter that's about consider context. And I think this is where context makes all of the difference. And context meaning, asking those who questions, like who's collecting the data, who is it for, who's harmed, who has benefited, and not even just right now, but like way far in the future from now. And these are the, you have to think at different time scales when we're um, thinking about these things as well. Okay, um, maybe one last question and then I'll hand it over for, for, to you two for any thoughts you wanna wrap us up with. One, two people in the Q&A want to know if you have any examples of sort of converting data scientists to a data feminism point of view. And a related question was, um, if the, the questioner said, I understand how the projects you talked about, the art projects and the social justice projects were data, but they didn't quite understand how they were science in the data science term. Uh, that's a, it, those are good questions. Um, I feel like we need like a 12 step program. I haven't <laughs> converted anyone. Um, I think other than, you know, I, you know, other than I think, you know, ultimately to show how asking these, you know, these questions and thinking about all of these additional questions surrounding the data ultimately leads to better data science, right? Like if you're working with missing data or data that, you know, has missing values, you are more aware of sort of in what cases your results can be applied or are predictive and in what cases they are not. If there's constraints surrounding the collection environment, you are more aware of those constraints by asking these questions first. And so I think the sort of to back up and say, you know, ideally everyone would become a data feminist because they would see that this ultimately leads to better, more accurate and more valuable data science work, right? Um, these are just sort of like, it's, it's good thinking to have done. Um, in terms of projects not being sort of data science, I mean, it's super interesting, right? Like the history of science, well, that's like a whole discipline, but you know, what counts as science is incredibly, you know, contextual and, you know, politicized and makes sense in a certain time and place. Um, you know, if you've ever read like, you know, 18th century science, it's totally nutty. People are performing like experiments in open air and then inviting spectators and writing down, sort of conjuring the scene about what happened and that was science, right? Um, and I think one of the things that we would sort of push back against and say, you know, does this mean that you shouldn't be, you know, like calculating p-values and, you know, choosing this regression model versus another? Like, by all means, you should be doing that type of work. And, you know, like, I teach my students how to do that. Um, but we also want to be really cautious about sort of policing what counts as science and what doesn't, because traditionally, again, it's women, it's people of color, it's other minoritized groups who are told, usually after doing the real work of creating that field, that their work is no longer science anymore, um, that they should be paid less, that they should be replaced by people who have technical credentials. Um, uh -oh, we're running out of time, so I'll get off my soapbox. I'll end there. Um, okay, Catherine, take over. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the only thing I'll say is in the, see, this is what's great about working with a historian. <laughs> it's like, everything has a long history and it's like um, important to know that history. The, for more recent history, I would also just point to the fact that data scientists were not data scientists until very recently. Um, so like somewhere in the like mid 2000s data data analysts, lowly number crunching data analysts um, get rebranded as data scientists. Um, and so and that was a move to elevate that position into, you know, ally that position with science um, as the kind of, you know, kind of unique validator of, uh, of all things uh, technical and um, positivist and so on. And so I, I think, again, just sort of questioning, like, um, sort of like where these terms come from and, and who gets encompassed by those terms. And then what happens when data analysts get rebranded as data scientists, like, lo and behold, like, all the women get pushed out of the field <laughs> and the men get paid more. Um, so, so yeah, I think we would push back and say, um, I think the, the, the idea for having a more inclusive definition is to be paying attention 
to the innovation that actually is happening and it's just it's happening at the margins and we can learn a whole lot from that work. Thank you. We are out of time. Um, I just wanted to say, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you again to Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren F. Klein. Their new book, Data Feminisms, is available digitally and via delivery. We shared links in the chat, as well as hashtags and handles to continue the conversation online. We welcome your feedback on this event and suggestions for future programming. Check out our website and sign up for the data and society events list to stay informed. Thank you. Good night.